Well, I'll tell you how it inspires me. Here she lived in a time, she, you know, she was a graduate, I think she went to school in the late 1800s, um, and she was in Philadelphia. She was one of the few blacks, or only black, to have graduated from her program. She goes back to the South. She experiences the Jim Crow laws and the segregation in the South. It was pre-internet, um, pre-emails, pre-Skyping like this, face, you know, great Facebooking, and yet she recognized the political advocacy that she saw was through letter writing. And she wrote, she had sent out letters to uh, many black nurses at the time, asking them, I guess, if they thought they could, they wanted to organize. We had the, at, by 1908, we had the, I'm gonna give you the newer names now, the American Nursing Association, which had formed, the National League for Nursing, which had already formed, although there were different names they had started 1896 and 1890, uh, 1893 and 1896, respectively. And here, by 1908, there was no organization that really um, addressed the racism that these nurses experienced. So she wanted to address that. She was concerned about educational standards for black nurses. She was concerned about um, practice standards, just like the ANA, the American Nurses Association and the National League for Nursing, but she, in addition, was concerned about the way nurses were treated. At the time, the American Nurses Association technically allowed Blacks to join, but interested Black nurses were ultimately blocked by state nursing associations, who refused to admit them. Although the American Nurses Association welcomed the nurses, state laws got in the way of Black nurses from practicing. Although faced with the obstacle of discrimination, the NACGN aimed to create work opportunities for Black nurses despite backlash from the general public. As the organization grew, more African American nurses joined, as well as doctors part of the American Medical Association. The organization was primarily made up of volunteers who fought for Blacks to have equal opportunities and rights. By merging with the American Nurses Association in the 1950s, the NACGN proved that compromise in dissolving their organization was key to furthering the cause to end discrimination. First of all, it allowed women to get have a voice, these black women especially, to have a voice among themselves and to advocate for change. They changed with the Army Nurse Corps and admission into the into World War One through the Red Cross. Um, some of my own work right now is looking at the American Red Cross. Um, they participated in the segregation of nurses and actually the discrimination of nurses. Um, nurses were, black nurses were not admitted into the Red Cross until really 1917. And then by 1918, that list where they start with 1A, 2A, 3A, A designating race, discriminating against black nurses from 1918 until 1948. So these nurses, the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses gave them a voice and gave them a powerful, like Ada Tomes, for example, gave the, and Martha Franklin, um, gave them a voice to really address the, the American Red Cross. Until the start of World War II, there were only 42 admitted and qualified Black nurses out of the 1,200 schools of nursing throughout the U.S. Out of the 1,200 schools, only 28 admitted Black nurses. By the end of World War II, this number grew to 330 schools. This progress was mainly due to efforts on behalf of the National Nursing Council for War Service, which worked to recruit more Black nurses. In 1948, only nine states and the District of Columbia blend blacks for nursing. Despite this, the American Nurses Association voted to offer individual membership to nurses who are barred from their state nursing association on the basis of race. These great strides by the American Nurses Association led the NACGN to merge with them. The dissolution of the NACGN did not represent an end to a discrimination-free organization, but rather represented a compromise that benefited the good of all black nurses. As they joined force, 
the ANA members, and the NACGN members could tackle the obstacles of segregation and discrimination together. Yeah, I do think that it's very important that we study the, this history, especially the African American experience in nursing, because nurses are the most trusted people right now. We um, are very well educated. We have a, a lot to offer the healthcare system, which we've been doing for hundreds of years now. And the black experience is extremely important for us to realize as we try to address diversity in the health sciences and in the um, and in the different roles that nurses play and it that that systematic racism or institutional racism does still exist and very often if we don't acknowledge our history whether it be the african-american experience or nursing history in general or whatever history of women and of roles and of gender then we really miss out the ability to argue our case for po policies for better health care outcomes, for health care projects, for finding funding for various things. So I, I'm a, I am a nurse historian. I am a nurse. I'm a public health nurse. I'm an educator. And the history is, that's my research area. So I think it's extremely important. And so your project probably is one of those important projects that's out there right now. By merging with the ANA, the NACGN proved that joining efforts to find a common cause was more important than maintaining their organizational name. According to an April 1951 edition of the American Journal of Nursing, it was only through the courage and energy of those who recognized the need, accepted the challenge, and had selfishly bore the brunt of the long struggle that we have made such progress. Without the volunteerism and activism of Black nurses, rights in nursing wouldn't have been established as quickly as they were. It was only through the efforts of Black nurses across the country, and especially those in the NACGN, that made nursing progress so quickly in the face of discrimination.